So maybe probably we start. So sure. yeah, so let me have a brief introduction first. Thank you, everyone. So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us and welcome to our engineering alloy seminar today. So today we are very fortunate to have Professor Dipanka Banerjee as our speaker. And many thanks to Professor Banerjee for accepting our invitation as well. So Professor Banerjee is a world leading expert on the physical metallurgy of titanium alloys and also development of some intermetallics for use in high temperature applications, who had worked for nearly 20 years for India's defense research and development organization, supervising many critical defense related materials programs about nickel, steel, titanium and other high, ultra high temperature alloys. Since 2010, he moved he moved to the Faculty of Materials Engineering in the India Institute of Science and continues to contribute to our metallurgy community. And today, Professor Banerjee is going to give us a talk on revisiting titanium alloy plasticity, and I'm sure it will be a very interesting and helpful one for our study and research. So now let's welcome Professor Banerjee to start his highly anticipated presentation for us. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Ingwe and uh, and Jessica for inviting me and all of you really. And it's good to be with you all this afternoon. Uh, I uh, have had connections with Imperial College for some time now. I'm old enough that I know I, I Got to know Harvey Flower and, and David West very well indeed with the early research that I was doing as a young guy. And, and now I'm young enough that I know David, David Dye and a few others quite well. So I sort of straddle a few generations here. So uh, let me then start my talk and uh, you will notice uh, slight change in title as I go along, but uh, let me get this to uh, full screen so that uh, we're all comfortable. And give me a minute to get that going. Yeah, it looks and great. No, and then I have to do something else, which is use slide slide. Are you good? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can see the laser point. All right, good. Thank you. So uh, first of all, uh, a few words about the Indian Institute of Science itself, where I'm currently now. We are a pretty small university. We, we have just about 450 faculty and about 4,000 students. And this is primarily a postgraduate program with a very small undergraduate program. And, and we are structured with these different divisions. This is our main administrative building in, in the Institute. And uh, within the Institute, our department, which is called, called Materials Engineering, has about uh, 25 faculty, uh, about 30 master students every year and, uh, and 100 plus PhD scholars. So the research areas have uh, broadened enormously recently. We, we started off with conventional metallurgy and now we have broadened into polymers, composites, functional materials, uh, computational material science, as has every materials engineering department all over the world, I think. Uh, so with that brief introduction to, to the Indian Institute of Science and the department, uh, the work that we do in our group is essentially related to various aspects of uh, what well, part of the work we do on our group is related to the modeling and prediction of various aspects of deformation behavior in titanium alloys. And uh, and and just to get us all on the same page initially, uh, I want to remind you that that we have a fairly simple phase diagram, at least on the uh, apparently uh, we have a high temperature BCC phase, a low temperature ACP phase that's called alpha, 
and we generally operate in the two phase alpha plus beta regime in engineering alloys. And, and uh, the alpha and beta phases are can be distributed in a, in a wide variety of ways. So you, you can have uh, uh, fully lamellar structures at various length scales within parent beta grains, or you can thermomechanically process to produce equiaxed alpha structures, a combination of equiaxed alpha structures and and these lamella structures which are called bimolar structures bimodal structures and and so the important uh, things that we think about are, are structural scale the fact that alpha is elastically and plastically anisotropic uh, the beta is elastically anisotropic there is an orientation relationship between alpha and beta and there are atomic nanoscale instabilities in both alpha and beta phases uh, so this is very broadly what we look at. And, and to start off with, I, I just want to give you a few examples of the kind of work we do. And, and uh, I must apologize to all of you because I think the abstract uh, was a bit misleading. It, it, uh, that's what I thought I'd talk about at that time. But since then I thought about, I thought I'd talk about something else altogether in titanium. Uh, which might be different from what you're used to and, and therefore I hope more interesting. But just to give you a glimpse of the of the research we do in, in engineering titanium alloys, uh, we look at the effect of structural scales and the crystallography of the distribution of the alpha phase. These, these uh, for example, these trivariant clusters that occur frequently, whatever the composition and microstructure of the transgrand alpha we look at. We look at the crystallography of such clusters and their effect on, on plasticity in, in these very fine scale structures uh, through uh, both crystal plasticity based microstrain simulations as well as uh, uh, really nano resolution DIC based microstrain descriptions. So this is just one example of the kind of work we do. Another example is our, is our work on thermomechanical processing. And, and for example, we've recently learned that when we recrystallize into these two phase structures, it is normally assumed that the equiaxed alpha is non-oriented with respect to the surrounding beta phase here. But we have recently found that the, the recrystallization process it results in an oriented relationship between the alpha phase that is recrystallizing and the surrounding beta phase. And, and uh, statistically, therefore, most equiaxed alpha is actually uh, oriented with respect to the surrounding beta phase, even after recrystallization to the equiaxed form. And we study the effects of that statistical uh, effect on, on slip transfer processes and so on between EQX, alpha and beta. But this is just to give you a flavor of the kind of work we do in engineering structures. And, and if you have questions about this, we can go into more detail later. But what I want to talk to you today is, is something completely different. And I, and I want to talk to you about, uh, let me call it micro or nanoplasticity or transformation-induced plasticity in the beta phase. So in that sense, uh, what I'm going to talk about is quite different from, from the kinds of work that I just described. So, so let me go back again to the phase diagram and, and remind you again that we are dealing with a high temperature BCC phase, a low temperature ACB phase. And while this is a typical phase diagram that we deal with, there are a variety of metastable transformations if you quench from the parent beta phase. So you can form hexagonal alpha phase uh, whose MS temperature is shown here. You can form orthorhombic martensite whose MS temperature is shown here. <clears throat> and as you increase the beta stabilizing content, uh, the martensite formation is suppressed below room temperature. And you have other metastable phases uh, that are called omega or O prime or even phase separation reactions. And, and what I want to talk to you today is about the martensitic transformation from beta to alpha double prime or alpha prime and the effect that it has on transformation induced plasticity. 
Okay, so in that sense, the stock is going to be quite different from from the usual engineering titanium alloy. Okay, so let me. This is a story, and and the story sort of started in in the 1990s, and and uh, we were working in in the early 1990s and published this in 98, and 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 these are typical martensite plates that you formed. Uh, that you find when you quench from the beta phase. Okay, uh, what is unusual about uh, this martensite plate is that you get this contrast within it. And those of you who are familiar with transmission electron microscopy <coughs> will immediately associate this with anti-phase domain contrast uh, that occurs in order disorder transmissions. But we know that the parent beta phase is disordered the Martin site is disordered. So the question to us was, what, what, what is this contrast that we're seeing over here? Now, I will not go into the detail of the experiments we did to identify the displacement vectors associated with this contrast, but I'm just going to tell you about the physical origin of this contrast because, because that is then later going to help the development of the theme that I'm going to talk about. OK, so how to understand this, we must understand the relationship between the parent beta phase and the product Martin site. OK, and, and the best way to do this is, is to look at the 110 planes of the beta phase. And we are looking here at the projected atomic positions looking down this direction so that these atoms on the next plane project over here. So, so here we have the corner atoms and the body centered atoms and, and these B atoms project in the center over here, here, here and so on. Now, this is a close packed plane in the beta phase and it is this plane that is transformed to the close packed plane of the alpha phase. And, and so I'm sure you're familiar with this. In, in that the A planes here have this hexagonal arrangement as do the B atoms and the B atoms are located in the C by two layer in the centroid position of the underlying A layer so that you have an AB AB stack. So we have to transform this into this. Now the way we do it is, is I start with that A layer of the beta phase, okay? Then I shear that and this shear is essentially a shear on the 112 plane along the 111 direction nearly. OK, so look at what I've started with and then I shear it. And so I've changed these angles, which were originally 70.5 and so on. And that shear has transformed all these angles to 60 degrees. So I've reproduced the A layer of the hexagonal phase to that shear. shear. OK. The next thing that I do is to look at the next layer and to produce the HCP phase, I have a little shuffle which takes the atoms in the next layer of the VCC phase. This little shuffle then brings it to the centroid positions above the A layer. So this was the mechanism which was first proposed by Burgess uh, uh, way back in 1936, okay, uh, or thereabouts. So first a 112, 111 shear, and then a 110, 110 shuffle, and that takes my BCC structure to the HCP structure. Okay, and, and so this is now my HCP structure. Now let's look at the consequences of this mechanism. The key consequence that I want to point out to you is that the shuffle can take place either in this direction of those B layer atoms, or it can take place in the other direction. Both are possibilities. So the shuffle can go from here to here or from here to here. OK, now as a consequence of this, the Burgers relationship, the relationship between the close packed planes and directions of the beta phase and the ACP phase gives you two rotational variables. But because of this shuffle in two possible directions, 
For a given rotational variant, you can get two translation variants from essentially the decentering. And you can understand this by this parent group subgroup relationship. Uh, these are the parent and the product, and this is the subgroup by which they're related in, uh, by which they're related by. Okay. And, and, and if you look at the group subgroup relationship, you can derive these 12 rotation variants and the two translation variants. Okay. But what is the consequence of this for a given rotational variant? It means in a given rotational variant, which is essentially a single plate of the Martin site, the shuffle can occur either in this direction, as I said, or in the other direction. And so you create between these two domains, if you will, a plane which has these wrong atoms. And this is really a stacking fault due to the transformation induced translation variants which can lie adjacent to each other in a given plate of Martin set. And, and this fault vector is, is a 16202-3 vector. And it is this fault here that gives you this contrast, which is so typical of antiphase boundaries, but is actually a stacking fault contrast. Okay. And, and so we have understood this stacking fault contrast, and, and we have understood it really on the basis of the uh, Berger's mechanism, which gives you, which is composed of the shear first and, and the shuffle next, and, and, and it is the shuffle which then gives you this contrast. Okay. Now, with this background of the work done in 1998 or so, I'm going to take you about 20 years forward, OK? And I was sitting at the University of North Texas, and I was writing a review article on, on, on perspectives in titanium metallurgy with Jim Williams, and perhaps some of you may have read this. But while, while, while writing that up, we, we, we noticed this anomaly, which we had not paid attention to. And the anomaly is this, that aluminum, oxygen, and tin suppress the MS temperature, that is the martensite start temperature, and omega formation temperature in titanium alloys. Well, this is, this, this is entirely unexpected. Why is it unexpected? Because aluminum and oxygen stabilize the alpha phase in titanium. Okay, aluminum, oxygen, and tin stabilize the alpha phase in titanium. And therefore, because they stabilize the product alpha phase, they should be expected to raise the MS temperature. And instead, they suppress the Martin Martensitic transformation. And, 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 and so this, this is entirely unexpected. And, and uh, we, we, we wondered how we could explain this. At around the same time, we noticed an article uh, by the, Tahara's group in, in, in Japan, well, Tahara is the first author, and, and it pointed out that in some titanium niobium alloys with oxygen added, you got additional spots in a typical 100 beta pattern, and those additional spots gave you a very fine domain structure, which they associated with a 110 one by one zero displacement. OK, so here was a clue. <coughs> here was a clue to the understanding of why aluminum, oxygen and tin may suppress the MS temperature. But we had to take this result forward. So the way we took it forward was to look at the pathways for the Martin City transformation. So the pathway that I described to you, the conventional pathway, is that you first have the shear, and then you have the shuffle, okay? And, and then that gives you the product fix. But we asked ourselves, what would happen if you induce the shuffle first and then had the shear, okay? What would that do if you reversed this mechanistic path? OK, and so here's our schematic description again. So we have this AB layering of the BCC structure. 
what we are going to do is to shuffle first. As a consequence of the shuffle, we have lost the cubic symmetry and it's now an orthorhombic symmetry. But notice that the BCC framework, the BCC framework is preserved. The lattice framework of the BCC is preserved, okay, even after the shuffle. And then you can shear it, okay, and then you get the HCP structure. Okay, but this is this is a different mechanistic path. Okay, and this has consequences. So we wanted to find out uh, whether this path was was a possible path, and so we looked at the stability of the beta phase and titanium alloys by looking at what is called the bond order diagram, uh, which which uh, came from Morinaga's group. And it's a nice little diagram. It looks at the bond order, which is a measure of the covalent bond strength between titanium and an alloying element. MD is the metal D orbital energy level. You can calculate these very easily according to their uh, paper. And, and it tells you the stability of Martensen. So you have, depending upon the B naught MD values for any composition that you put in, you, you have the MS temperature, the MF temperature, uh, and you have the beta to beta plus omega boundary as well. OK, now we wanted to play with with the boundaries between the MS and MF temperature to see whether aluminum additions. Would promote. The shuffle. So we melted all these alloys that you see here. OK, with niobium, molybdenum and with aluminum added to understand. Uh, whether the process that we were proposing, the inversion in the mechanistic path was actually so. OK, so here is our result and it's and it's it's really uh, we've we've looked at. Uh, it's what I'm showing you is a summary of these three papers over here. So we've looked at uh, aluminum and molybdenum, aluminum additions to molybdenum. Uh, we've looked at zirconium additions to niobium because we wanted to look at the effect of zirconium. And we have looked at titanium molybdenum with ultra low oxygen as well uh, in order to understand whether oxygen has anything to do with it at all. And so here is is we we, we replicate uh, Tahara's work in that uh, that we have these domains. OK, but now we add to it this these beautiful uh, high angle angular dark field results from CMAS at OSU, Yu Feng uh, doing the work over there in these alloys. And, and, and so you can see that the domains, these domains here at very high magnification. And so here is the projected atom picture when there is only a shuffle, OK? When there's only a shuffle and no shear. And you can see how that projected atom picture matches exactly with what you see in this region, OK? So here is the normal BCC phase, and this is within one of these domains that you see over here, and you can see the displacement of these atoms in relation to that, OK? So we show over here what Tahara speculated that that these domains, which we have named O prime for reasons that I won't talk about, are really associated with the structure that results from this 110 shuffle. OK, so look at the difference now between the structure that results from the conventional Martensitic transformation and the shuffle. OK, uh, I must track of time. OK, so we uh, uh, we have the conventional Martensitic transformation, which resolves, which which has a macroscopic shear, which gives you these very large plates with the stack and fall structure inside. When we have the shuffle first, we get these coherent very fine scale domains of this orthorhombic symmetry that arises just because of the shuffle. So these are two very different structures, OK, because of the different paths that they follow. 
So the shuffle preserves the BCC lattice framework, and we have this entirely coherent structure of these orthorhombic domains. OK. And, and so we, we are at not showing you the results in all the alloys. Uh, essentially, we are able to show that the shuffle is promoted by, by the elastic instability. OK, the elastic instability that is associated with this particular shuffle, and that can be related to a particular phonon wave. And these are different phonon waves of the shear, the beta to omega transformation, and the beta to the O prime transformation. That is just a shuffle, the effective uh, elastic constants, and and the elastic instability that can arise in these elastic constants. So, so for example, if this elastic instability, this phonon wave arises, occurs at a higher temperature than this phonon wave, then you will get the shuffle first and the shear later. But if this phonon wave occurs at a higher temperature than this phonon wave, you will get the shear first and then the shuffle. OK, and, and so there are essentially the suppression of the martensite with aluminum, zirconium, tin and oxygen additions occurs because those additions promote the elastic, alter the elastic instability of the beta phase such that this elastic instability precedes this elastic instability at a given composition as a function of temperature. OK, and, 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 that, and, and that results in a suppression of the Martensitic transformation. Um, and, and I'll show you as we go along what happens there. OK, so then we. That's where we stopped, and then then this work was continued by our colleagues at, at OSU and, and 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 in fact China, and and I'm describing to you some of their work, and what they did what they did was to explore what happens that if if you start with a structure like this, and you then cool it down, will you then transform that structure to the Martin cell? And that's what they were looking at. OK, so you structure, you start with a structure like this, which has just the shuffle domains, if I can call it that, the O prime domains. And we're going to cool it down. So these are different variants of the O prime in the structure, and we're going to cool it down and see what happens. So as you cool it down, first of all, you find that the modulus decreases. OK. Uh, forget about these two curves. You find that the modulus decreases and then increases. OK, and it decreases. And remember, the decrease in modulus with temperature is very unusual. So the modulus decreases to a minimum and then increases. OK. Added to that elastic modulus analysis variation with temperature, we looked at the effect of cooling on the O prime phase. OK, so we found that the beta is has these O prime domains at room temperature. OK, and as we cool down inside the microscope. There is the shear begins so that you transform those O prime domains to the alpha prime domains. OK. So indeed, we have reversed the mechanism. OK, we have started with the shuffle. And then produced the shear, OK, to transform the shuffle domains to the Martin set. And in cooling, we can measure the, the, the lattice strain that arises due to the shear transformation. So we start with zero strain because in the O prime domains, because because the BCC framework is preserved and it's completely coherent. But as we shear, as we cool down, the level of shear increases such that you, in, you now induce a lattice strain. And we have plotted here the increase in lattice strain as these domains transform to Martensite. OK, but look at what is unique here. It is a continuous transformation of the O prime domains to Martensite. 
it does not occur athermally at a sudden, sudden temperature. So we have created these shuffle domains and they continuously transform to mark the same. OK, that's just one conclusion. The second conclusion, which is extremely important, is that if the Martin site, if the shear occurred first, you would get large Martin site plates. However, in this, as we cool down from O prime down to low temperatures, it is those O prime domains that transform to the Martin site. Okay, so look what we have created starting from this shuffle. O prime domain structure. We have created a nano distribution of Martin site within the parent beta phase. OK, and it turns out that we get the identical structure if you cold roll the material as well. So there is a cooling transformation of the O prime to Martin site, nano domains of Martin site, or there is a stress induced transformation of the O prime domains to Martin site. OK, and so what is unique about the structure? Two things. One is that a continuous transformation of these nano domains to Martin site and the fact that the Martin site itself is a nano domain structure rather than a large macroscopically large plate. OK, so this is actually quite similar uh, to ideas of strain glass. Some of you may have heard about this. And the idea in, 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 in many materials, whether it be glass or paramagnetic transformations or paraelectric transformations, is, is that there is an intermediate glassy state in which you have uh, uh, domains of nano order frozen in, in essentially a glassy disordered state. In the case of our solid state transformation, we are talking about a crystalline parent phase if you get martensite, then you, then you just transform macroscopically to the martensite, but the change in the transformation mechanism leads to these nano domains of the intermediate phase, which are stable and finally transform to martensite. So in that sense, uh, this is identical in, in its physics to the strain glass transformation. OK, what is the implication of this? And I'm, and I'm sort of going to end up in a few slides now. The most interesting implication of this is that you can produce the invar and LNVAR effects. So look what's happening when you cool down those nano domains into martensite. There is a normal thermal contraction stemming from the anaheim uh, vibration of the crystal lattice, but the transformation strain from the growth of the martensite nano domains expands the locally the crystal lattice. So these two balance out each other to produce one of these effects, the environment. Look at the, how the modulus behaves. The modulus of the parent beta matrix must increase slowly to 150K. But the consequence of the decreasing, uh, the consequence of the growth of the Martin site is that you have a nonlinear increase in modulus resulting from the transformation induced strain as you cool down, which opposes the increase in the normal increase in modulus. So again, you have a constant elastic modulus as a function of temperature as you cool down. And you have a constant uh, lattice parameter, macroscopic lattice parameter, if you will, as you cool down. OK, so you have the invar and LNVAR effects arising out of manipulating the structural path from the beta phase to the Martin state. OK, and, and, and so I want to I want to now briefly touch upon uh, gum metal, which was uh, discovered uh, by this Japanese group. It's, it's a very famous paper and, and published in Science in 2003. And, and they show you the constancy of modulus with temperature and the constancy of linear expansion with temperature in the alloy. OK, and so really, in spite of an enormous amount of subsequent work, and, and David Dye has been working on this as well, there was not quite a satisfactory explanation of, of, of these, these effects in, in the very famous gum metal. 
And we believe that it is this mechanistic path of the transformation from the parent beta phase to the nano Martin site, which is actually producing uh, these effects in the material. So uh, uh, I want to finally point out that uh, this, this, these effects that we are talking about are, are really a subset of many effects in such metastable beta titanium alloys. Uh, you have shape memory, you have twinning in induced plasticity, you have transformation induced plasticity, and the, and the transformation induced strains that I, and the modulus effects that I described to you is a subset of this transformation induced plasticity effect in, in, in these very specific compositions. Okay, and, and so you can realize these effects in a variety of B naught MD combinations, and therefore you can always choose compositions which lie, uh, alloy compositions which lie in this B naught MD green regime to produce the kind of invar L invar effects uh, that I just described to you, and and all of this has. Uh, 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 implications uh, today in, in engineering in terms of the development of uh, metastable beta alloys for essentially biomedical applications and, and various other applications. So I'll end over here and I'm happy to take any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. Thank you, Professor Banerjee. So I hope I've kept to time. I, I'm, I wasn't quite sure. Yeah, yeah, it's a per perfect timing. Okay. Hi, David. How are you? Good to see you. Good, thanks. Good to see you. It's lovely talk. No, it's. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I... Yeah. The photon I... part of the story has been coming for a long time, and I've been wanting. I, I, I tried to nail it down in 2009, didn't quite get there. I know that work. Right. Um, and there's a manuscript kicking around where a collaborator did some beautiful inelastic X-ray on one of her Yang Yulin House alloys. Yes, so it was really cool, but it's not out. So you know, you've got okay. you know, but it's yeah, love. It's a lovely story. And the O prime thing, I thought the O prime thing was like some curiosity for ages, but yeah. Why the O prime thing actually matters? Yeah, really. Well, I, I I sort of struggled between talking about plasticity and engineering alloys and this, and I thought that this might be different enough for this engineering research group that they they see something very different, and I hope that it's all right. Well, this is the thing, right? So this these alloys get, you know, actually these papers get cited a lot, right? So they 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 do excite people in the science community. Um. And, uh, but it is like a conversation between about 20 people in the world. Right, right. And, and there are no industrial uses. Um, um, and they're all, I always ask people on any of these alloys, well, the French guys, when they say, oh, this is an amazing alloy, I say, well, what if you age it at 80 degrees <laughs> C for a month? You know, does it have any ductility or has it, or has it got too much omega? Um, and everybody's always like, oh, no, this is only ever a thing that's in the, th you know, thousand degrees C beta quench condition. <laughs> so, you know, um, one day it might be important, but yeah. it's good fun in the meantime. Yes, that's that's how I see it at this time. And and, and so we, we sort of continue our work in, on plasticity and alpha beta alloys, but uh, that's the bread and butter. And that's where the money is that I'm getting for, for work and so on. Yeah. Anyway, we should we should stop gas. Some of these guys should, should probably have hopefully have questions. Yeah, so if I may ask a question, Professor Banerjee. Sure. So you said if the shuffle happened first, like yeah. how I, mean, I might have missed it. So how it could suppress the transformation? Right, OK. So, so actually, that that if I can, I should go back to the slides. Yes, I did not, and 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 I did not explain that well, but it it relates to this very first thing that I showed. 
I'm sorry, I could have done this another way instead of going back slide by slide. Yeah, so so if the shear occurs first, OK, and, and let me go back one more slide. So this is a single plate of Martin said, OK? Now, if the shear occurs first, and I'm trying to give you an explanation, the, the shuffle can, uh, can occur only in, in two possible 110 directions, once the shear has happened, OK? But if the shuffle occurs first, then you get 12 possible variants for the shuffle because you have these six 110 planes, right, on which the shuffle is occurring, and two possible 110 directions. Now, the moment you've created 12 variants of those shuffle domains, a single Martin site plate cannot drive through these 12 domains. It's, it's crystallographically incompatible. OK. OK. And therefore, the transformation to Martin site must occur within the domains in which the shuffle has already occurred. And, and, and that is why you get these nano domains of single crystal Martin site, if you will. OK, yeah. OK, okay. And, and that crystallography is defined in detail in that last Actimet paper, if you want to, if you want to examine it more carefully. All right, so do you mean like if the travel happened on one direction only, then there will be fewer variants for the further transformation to there will be a fewer number of variants that is that possible. Is right. That is right. And in effect, you have created by the shuffle occurring first, yeah. you have created these embryos of Martin site, right? Coherent yeah. embryos of Martin site. Uh, because that's one part of the Martin City transformation. Mm -hmm. Right. And and then so it's and, and those are the nuclei for the Martin site. You have you have created the nuclei for the Martin site. Which then transforms you cool down. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, just uh, slightly further on this. So, yes. uh, what's the interface look like for this? If the travel happened first, I know like for if the shear happened first, there will be plates. So yes, if, if this... and, and plates with a habit plane and a lattice invariant shear, which gets spinning and slip and so on. But uh, okay, so let me go to this. Here we go. Look at this is the beta phase. Out there, yeah, this is the phase in which. So because you have preserved the beta phase framework, you see that it's completely coherent. Yeah, because these atoms, these atoms have not moved. You've only shuffled every alternate 110 layer. So you have preserved the lattice framework of the beta phase without any change in that. Yeah, and it's completely coherent except for these shuffles on every other one and zero. So it's a very coherent. But no I mean, yeah. from this, and if the uh, further shear will happen from from here, from this yeah. step, yeah. So what would the final interface look like? So is this still near? Is this still will it be globular or? Just it, it stays globular, and that's what's really nice about this. Uh, and of course, one didn't know what to expect till it was actually done. OK, so so this is an example uh, and where it's gone to Martin site. But let me take this. OK, so I have this is the Martin site domain and you see it's globular. Yeah, okay. yeah, OK, right yeah. now I have drawn for you a straight line which goes through the uh, through the BCC phase atoms. Yeah, OK, and if yeah. this is a vertical line which goes through these BCC phase atoms, but look where it emerges on the other side. OK, it has not stayed within that column of BCC atoms, so there is a shear. Between this point and this point. Mm -hmm. So the interface looks coherent. But you can clearly see that that the shear has happened locally to produce the alpha double prime structure uh, to produce the orthorhombic Martin site structure. Yeah, I see. Wow, this is it's beautiful and direct proof that this this guy Yu Feng and Hamish Fraser's group is just a fantastic uh, microscopist, and his eye is beautiful. Yeah. Wow.
Great. If you Thank go you. and sit with them, it's incredible. And it's an incredible Microsoft. It pretty much only operates in this mode. It has four users, five users, and it's just beautiful. So from our audience, do we have any other questions? But sorry, because sorry, because I just have a, a final one. So in the early part of your presentation, you talk about some recrystallization in titanium, and you mentioned about some orientation relationship. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. I, I you know, and I think David is going to be interested in that. Yeah. And it's, so let me uh, go back to that. Thank you. Uh, and let me do that in a slightly different way because it's not a very efficient way of doing it. OK, so. OK, so this is a is a sort of summary of the work. OK, uh, so what we did is mm -hmm. we we took a structure which. Uh, which is like this. This is tie triple five three David, OK? And 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 so it's 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 age to produce the structure, and and then we recrystallize we processed it hot processed it, okay, and uh, let can I do this with something else for the moment because huh. uh, there's all kinds of stuff here in the original talk that I was planning. Which which can be done another day if there's a lot of interest. But OK, here we go. So we have a starting single grain of beta, and we have these alpha plates that are distributed in single grain of beta, about 30%. And we have processed it. And, and, and you can see the recrystallization of beta has occurred as marked by the red boundaries here. And you can see what's happened in the alpha as well, what we typically call globularization. But these very different orientations in this fairly high resolution EBSD. OK, now this is OIMPD work, and it shows an extremely fine recrystallized alpha grain, which is nucleated from the original plate. OK, so this is not globularization as we conventionally know it. It is actually nucleated there. This was a single crystal of beta, a single grain of beta, and, and there has been recrystallization. So you have two new grains of beta. And now if you look at the orientation relationships between this alpha one, this alpha two, the beta one, and the beta two, you find that they're all burgers related to each other. Okay, so what we are proposing is that the recrystallization process, and, and you'd expect that the recrystallization process would give you an incoherent equiaxed alpha phase, is actually giving an incoherent equiaxed phase, but it is burgers related to the surrounding beta grains. And the only way we could see this was to use Ti triple five three, where you could quench in the uh, process structure and the recrystallized structure. I mean, if this stuff transforms to alpha, then you just won't see these relationships very well. OK, so we've called this epitaxial recrystallization. Yeah. And, and so now uh, this is the same alloy, and, and this is the initial orientation with, with all these multiple 12 variants. And, and just by deformation, you, you begin to see the scattering in, 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 the, in the texture of the alpha phase from this sharp transformation texture to this diffuse structure. The beta is just recovering, so you don't see much change in texture, some recrystallization uh, from this. But look what happens when you anneal. You again statistically, statistically restore the Burgess relationship. OK, and this is because of this epitaxial recrystallization process. Right, and, and so uh, let me, which slide was this? So this is now tie 624. OK, we have not processed this. This is as a seed structure from Pratt and Whitney. And, and, and this is the alpha phase partitioned over here. Again, statistically, the Burgess orientation relationship is retained statistically between these alpha grains and the surrounding beta that is present in this transformed beta structure. Now, this is this is major implications for slip. 
Okay, so we have slip transfer between the equiax alpha and the surrounding beta. Okay, uh, and and so we've investigated that as well, uh, and and we find that uh, out of the forty odd grains that we investigated, uh, slip systems activated due to slip transfer into transformed beta was about 30, and slip systems that were independently activated in the transformed beta due to the global Schmidt factor was only about 12. And in the cases where slip systems were activated due to slip transfer, you had a high M prime value. Uh, you know what the M prime value is, right? It's, it's the angle between the planes on on either grain and the slip directions in either grain cos lambda cos theta or whatever. And, and this, this happens simply because statistically a large number of equiax alpha grains are actually burgers related to, to the surrounding beta that exists. Okay, so this is the story that we have at this point in time. And, and uh, this is just about to be published because we have now with reconstruction of the parent beta and tie 6242 and so on, we have quantified the deviation from a non-random, from a random equiax alpha to a burgers oriented equiax alpha. And, and, and statistically and quantitatively, how many of those grains are, are burgers alpha oriented and the consequence on, on slip transfer. Uh, that's the story. And I'm sure you will have a million questions about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I see. So, sorry, here in this table, the 10% is you control the fraction of the volume fraction of beta, right? 10, uh, no, that, This 10% is a strain. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah. This is a different strains. Okay. So, if I, yeah. if I flip back the package yeah. to your. EBSD on the, the general market. OK, so I have two questions. One is about this, that this, about this the Pratt Whitney 6042. Uh, the 6242? Uh, okay. uh, no, no, no. A couple of slides. You, you flicked through it a minute ago. The one before, slide 30, that one. So how did you do this partitioning of the transform beta from the primary alpha? Oh, that's uh, that's actually simply uh, you can do phase partitioning, right? That's not a problem. But a simple phase partitioning will also give you the, the mm -hmm. lab alpha, right? So then you use the, 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 the TSL software to say, I only want to image things with a certain uh, aspect ratio because TSL in its grain size evaluation is evaluating an aspect ratio. Yeah. So you say, I'm going to image only that aspect ratio, which is approximately yeah. equal. And, and with a little bit of playing, you can, and, you can eliminate that. And then I guess there's, there's a couple of questions. One is, how do you make uh, disk material with multivariant primary like that? And the other well, question is, I if mean, you we, do... We are really... Uh, you're talking about primary multivariate primary alpha, right? Uh -huh. uh, you're really talking about the MTR business and so on. Mm-hmm. Right, and 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 so that's uh, well, you know this this work this is this is uh, funded by Pratt and Whitney and and we talked to Vatish, to whom you know I think, and Dave Farrell. Mm -hmm. mm. And one of the questions they've asked me is, why do we see such large MTR regions? I mean, by the way, they are giving me material where you don't see, where you hardly see. MTR. Mm -hmm. How they're processing it? I have ideas about this, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and uh, this is related a bit to the next part of this, uh, David. Well, so that's my question: is if you've got lots of different variants of primary alpha, yeah, do you still have actually one or two easy slip systems that can go through multiple primary alpha orientations anyway? And I haven't done the math, so I'm genuinely asking. I'm sorry, I'm not, when I talked about the slip transfer. Yeah. Okay. I was not talking about slip transfer from one equiax grain to another. Mm. I was talking about slip transfer from an equiaxed grain 
into the transform surrounding beta. transform beta. Yeah. Okay. And I was saying that that is occurring in many grains, in many equiax mm -hmm. grains, because there is an orientation relationship which makes the slip planes parallel. Yeah. In the, in the transform. What yeah. Salem said 15 years ago, Iron Salem said, was that you know when you've got a colony like that in the transform beta, there's still one or two A slip systems that can make it through the alpha beta structure because it works. The dislocation works in the in the beta anyway, as well as the alpha. And I'm just would, wondering if there's a dislocation that then, if you go from the primary alpha into the transform beta, can you then go back into another primary alpha in a different orientation without really disturbing the you could, you could, you could. And, I, and I'm going to tell you why, because there is a consequence of this epitaxial recrystallization that, that mm. I haven't gone into. And I want to touch upon that. So we took the same material and, and we beta heatrated it and quenched it, right? Or, or we had very small volume fractions of equiax down. Now, if, if, if there is a transformation from alpha to beta, rather than beta to alpha, you get from, again, the Burgess orientation relationship, very specific axis angle pairs between the beta grains. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that most of the beta grain boundaries that you see over here have some form of this axis angle pair. Mm -hmm. OK, now if you look at the consequences of that, and that's David, I'm answering your questions <laughs> mm. with, with slides. So, 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 what I've drawn here is beta grains, okay, which are oriented with respect to each other by these four axis angle pairs. Okay, so there is a rotation around one, one, one by sixty. You look. You should look at the gray rectangles. Yes, 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 I am. Yeah. And, and, and this and this and this. Now it turns out that the alpha phase, okay, can share the same alpha phase, can share a Burgess relationship between all these beta grains. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. And therefore, in principle, in principle, if you, if you, if you had adjacent. <laughs> Could you could transfer back into another prime? Yeah, it could. Yeah, so there's going to be a prism A that goes from out. It's a statistical out. process which has to be understood probabilistically and not, you know, I. Yeah. Yeah. But it just means you have, you know, a very small number of quite easy slip systems, and all the others will be that's microstructurally right. inhibited. So you'll that's have a, a grounds for a lot of localization. That's right. That is right. That is right. right. So you'll know in, in some ways you're, if you make lots of variants, but you still have about a big prior beta grain size, you still have a big macrosome, and that's that. Yes. Yeah. So there's no you can't trick your way by out clever alpha beta processing out of the problem of having big prior beta grains. If you don't have enough strain in your forging, you don't have enough strain in your forging. That's it. That is it. Absolutely. You've got to have strain in your forging. I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. So yeah. we we are currently doing well big work with uh, with uh, these uh, very low MPR samples and and uh, and looking at crack initiation sites and and they're quite different from. The things that you see in, you know, the kind of work Fionn and, and, and so many people have done. Uh, uh, because you have this primary alpha uh, surrounded by, uh, sorry, uh, this primary alpha surrounded by all this these transformed beta colonies. And, and the question is, do you have crack nucleation in these grains or, or these single grains? Is alpha alpha contact mm. important? Uh, and all of it is looking interesting. I, I just have initial results at this mm. time. Yeah. Yeah. And Treza has this interesting thing about um, basal twist boundaries on on alpha alpha grains, which she's in yeah. at the moment. Which is a new which is a new idea in cracking this initiation in time. Which I was, uh, yeah. You don't get one of those every day, so it's quite. Yeah. 
that's the other thing. If you haven't seen that, I only became aware of that paper recently, so I was like, aha. Whereas, so I'm, t I'm, I'm telling everybody I know about it just because I thought it was quite cool. That's, that's pretty, I think that's pretty isolated though. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's probably the mechanism when you don't have a long slip path in the sort of stro model type thing we've been pursuing yeah. for ages. Right. Yeah, if you, if, you, if you suppress that mechanism, then another one's got to come along some, somewhere. Yeah. So. yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Do we have some time? A few minutes, or what's? Uh, um, yeah. Well, okay. I guess. Just... No, we're 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 past the, the hour. We said we said we say to people. So I, I think we should okay. be. So okay. maybe we we're probably Japanko and I could could um, and will go all day, right? So yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but just uh, please, I think I will. S can I forward your email to all our colleagues and students? Sure. So okay. further questions can we all. Right. He sent to you. Yeah. Okay. Well, right. thanks a lot again. Great talking to you all. And take Thank care. you very much. Yeah, lovely Bye -bye. to see you. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone.